Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, and welcome to The Authority. I'm Joseph Pierce, and now we've reached in our chronological journey through the great some of the great writers in the history of Western civilization. We've reached the age of romanticism. So before we say much else, uh, we should perhaps say what uh, romanticism is. So today's author is William Blake, and he is one of the first generation of romantic poets. Um, We'll be talking also about Wordsworth and Coleridge, who um, uh, uh, are perhaps even more important from the perspective of romanticism. But we're taking William Blake first because he's first in terms of chronology. He's somewhat older than uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. So Blake was born in 1757, and he he had volumes of poetry published before Wordsworth and Coleridge burst onto the scene with their uh, co-published, co-authored book, Lyrical Ballads, in 1798. Blake was already published then. However, we need to know, really, that uh, he was not that well-known. He became better known later. So in some senses, we could have looked at Wordsworth and Coleridge first because they were better known first. But but because Blake was was actually writing before they did, I thought I would take it this way round. So we, we need to understand what romanticism is before we can really understand what William Blake, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge and even later romantic poets such as Keats, Byron and Shelley and romantic novelists such as Mary Shelley and the Bronte sisters this whole movement of romanticism, what is it? Well, in many respects, it's a reaction against the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment, which is a name it, it gave to itself, that we are the enlightened ones. The, another name that, 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 that it gave to itself was the Age of Reason. Uh, this was a, a, an idea that, that the past was inferior to the present, that only the present age was enlightened and understood reality. Only the present age was rational and used reason, that the previous ages were all um, shackled by superstition. So it's um, it's dis- dismissing the past. It's what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery, uh, superciliousness towards one's ancestors, to believe that the, the latest generation knows all the truth, or at least more than all previous generations. So this has dismissed the great legacy of the great writers, such as Homer, Dante, and Shakespeare. And we should say, by the way, that there haven't been any writers of that caliber since. Or the great philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And it's been said that the history of philosophy is footnotes on Plato. In other words, that that, that really all that modern philosophy uh, is able to do is to, is to comment upon, dismiss, or distort the great teachings of the great Greek philosophers. That great Greek philosophy was baptized by by uh, philosophers such as uh, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. You could say St. Augustine baptizes Plato, Christianizes it. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas baptizes Aristotle, Christianizes it. This is the edifice upon which Western civilization has been built in terms of goodness, truth and beauty. Indeed, the very notions of goodness, truth and beauty come from the, the transcendental metaphysics of, uh, of, of Greek philosophy. So the Enlightenment turns its back on all of that and insists, amongst other things, on empiricism, that something has to be able to be quantified and measured to be real or true, so that things that are transcendental, that can't be measured or quantified empirically, such as goodness, love, truth, reason, itself, of course, beauty, that these things somehow are not real or at least less real than those things that can be quantified. So ultimately, the the, the Enlightenment was rooted in philosophical materialism, that matter was all that ultimately mattered, uh, and that therefore other things such as goodness, truth, beauty, ideas such as humanity, abstract concepts were... um, did not matter, at least not as much. So romanticism was a was a reaction against that, uh, and particularly uh, insisting that emotions are important, that feeling is important, that our experience of things such as beauty 
uh, is important, even though we can't measure it empirically. Beauty is real. Uh, goodness is real. Um, so uh, this was the romantic reaction, uh, accentuating feeling over empirical uh, measurement, shall we say. This is one aspect of it. So William Blake uh, was uh, of this ilk. Now, he's a conflicted person. Um, so uh, we see this in his in his poetry. He was all, he, we should also say he was a, a very good artist um, and illustrated um, various works of literature and from scripture. So, for instance, the Book of Job, he illustrated Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, so he's a significant artist, but we're discussing him in the authority uh, as an author of some uh, great literature. There's also some weird literature. So the marriage of heaven and hell, a sort of dualistic, uh, weird understanding of things. So Blake might have called himself a Christian, but he was certainly a very odd sort of Christian. Uh, but the best way of understanding him probably is to look at his work and to, and, and to discuss it from there. He was certainly no friend of Orthodox Christianity. He did not like the Catholic Church. Several of his poems um, speak disparagingly of priests and uh, of, uh, of, uh, of his understanding of Christianity as being something sort of dark and, and um, uh, life negating. Uh, so a very sort of well, a misunderstanding of what Christianity is. But he, we see also his uh, anti-Catholicism, the fact that he's alleged to have been uh, very actively, violently involved in the Gordon riots. And the Gordon riots took place in England, um, uh, led actually by a Scotsman called Lord Gordon. But it was a, a protest against the giving of an element of uh, religious liberty and political rights to England's Catholics, who at this stage had basically been without any rights uh, and persecuted relentlessly for um, 250 years at this point, um, from the 1530s to the 1780s, the time of the Gordon riots. So the fact that Blake felt strongly enough against Catholicism that he's willing to actually riot uh, to to uh, in protest at Catholics having political rights and liberties says a great deal of where he stands. Does this mean that the Catholics should not really bother to read him? Absolutely not. And I hope that the, the few poems we're going to look at will show that. So I'm going to actually focus in, in here on three of his poems. Um, and we'll begin with Jerusalem. Now, all of, all of these poems are included in uh, the, the book Poems Every Child Should Know, which is published by Tan Books and which I compiled. And the selection uh, from Lynn Blake's, Blake's poetry includes these four poems. The first I'm going to start with is the poem Jerusalem, which was set to music by Sir Hubert Parry and has become, at least in some circles, as the unofficial English national anthem, uh, the British national anthem, if you like, or the national anthem of the British Commonwealth or the British Empire is God Save the Queen, I was going to say, but now we have to say God Save the King. But this is, uh, has been adopted, especially, for instance, by rugby supporters of the England, the national team, as, uh, as England's unofficial national anthem when sung to the tune of Hubert Parry. I'm not going to sing it, you'll be very pleased to know, um, but I'm going to read the actual original poem by William Blake. And it's, it's actually part of a bigger work, but it's known colloquially as Jerusalem. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds, unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Now, irrespective of William Blake's own odd theology, 
uh, uh, and quirky understanding uh, of religion. This is a poem which uh, all Catholics can feel entirely comfortable with, and I'm going to unpack it a bit. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green, and was the Holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? This might seem an odd question, or two odd questions. Of course we might say uh, that the the uh, Holy Lamb of God, that Jesus Christ, didn't set feet in ancient time on England's mountains green or pleasant pastures. But in actual fact, there is an ancient legend, two ancient legends that go right back to the dawn of, of, of English history. In fact, before English history, England means Angle land, the land of the Angles. This story goes back before the Angles arrived to the time just after the Roman conquest. Uh, so actually this would be just about before the time of the Roman, Roman conquest, the original story. So the legend is that St. Joseph of Arimathea, a relative of uh, 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 Jesus, brought him as a child, if you like, on a holiday or a vacation to England. Uh, unlikely, not necessarily impossible. Uh, we don't probably should not believe it has been literally true, but St. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich merchant. There was a lot of mining in southwest England. And the story, the legend is that they arrived at Glastonbury. Glastonbury in Somerset in southwest England is the oldest uh, known uh, centre of Christianity in England. Certainly, uh, even in the third century, they were talking about the chapel to the Blessed Virgin in Glastonbury being ancient. So it's entirely possible that uh, it dates back to the first century. The first Christian missionaries would certainly have come to England uh, with the arrival of the Romans. That's the way Christianity was spread around the empire with the, uh, uh, with, with, where the Romans went. Christians were going too because Rome was becoming Christian. Um, so the usual date for the first arrival of, of, of missionaries to England is 63 AD, 300 years, sorry, 30 years after the crucifixion. And again, the legend is that they were led by St. Joseph of Arimathea. And on that occasion, uh, he brought with him the, uh, the, 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 um, the chalice that was either used at the Last Supper or was, um, uh, the chalice by which the blood of Christ was 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 collected uh, when it was spilled uh, after the uh, the uh, the lance is placed into Christ at the crucifixion. Again, very unlikely, but very important, even if it's not true, because it's from this that the, all of the uh, legends of the Holy Grail, uh, King Arthur and the, the quest for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is this chalice that's allegedly been brought to England by St. Joseph of Arimathea. But prior to that, it said that the feet of Christ himself set foot on England's pleasant land, green and pleasant land, um, because he was brought by his relative, St. Joseph of Arimathea. Now, I say, irrespective of whether it's true, the fact that there's a desire for it to be true says a great deal for the faith of, the, of England, the fact that this legend is part of England experience, the whole Arthurian legends based upon it, but also the fact it's desired by William Blake says a great deal about his own um, um, fervent wish for it to be true, for Christ to have stepped foot. Um, was Jerusalem built here among these dark satanic mills? So this again is a motif of romanticism to, to be uh, opposed to the, 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 the pollution uh, of the Industrial Revolution, to the change of lifestyle, to the urbanization of culture, to the belching of pollutants, uh, of smoke into the atmosphere from these new industrial mills brought about by the invention of the steam engine. England was ahead of the world in the, in, in the Industrial Revolution, middle of the 1700s. So Blake is, is, is writing when this, this time and era of change, and he sees these, this industrialism as satanic. Now, was Jerusalem built here among these dark satanic mills? So that's the first, the first part of the poems are all questions. The second part is, is, is a call to arms. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem 
in England's green and pleasant land. It's a call to arms. It's a call to build Jerusalem, to build something which is Christian, at least according to Blake's understanding of it, in the face of the satanic presence of industrialism. This is a motif of romanticism, this call, this love of the beauty of nature as opposed to the the the, uh, the ugliness that's been wrought by, by scientific progress. Okay, let's move on to another poem. Uh, Blake wrote some poems of songs, songs of innocence and some songs of experience. And I'm going to put them side by side here. It's a poem called The Lamb. Little lamb, who made thee? Does, does thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly, bright. Gave thee such a tender voice making all the veils rejoice, little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou now know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek, and he is mild. He became a little child. I, a child, and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So here we see some, We see a, a motif in much literature. Questions are asked on behalf of nature, which can't answer for itself. And then the poet answers uh, on behalf of creation. So asking the question, who made the, the little lamb? The little lamb can't answer the question. The little lamb doesn't know the answer. Um, we should say, by the way, if you in England, even today, is full of sheep. If you walk in, 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 in parts of the country, and so at certain times of the year, of course, it's full of lambs gambling around the uh, the fields. Uh, there's not much more cute than a, than a lamb. But little lamb, I'll tell thee, the person who made these met called by thy name, he called himself a lamb, the lamb of God, of course. This is a direct reference to Christ. He's meek and mild, became a little child. And I, a child, in other words, a, a, a man should be childlike. We, we, we were told by Christ, unless we become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I, a child, and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. So God bless the lamb, God bless us, because God has blessed us uh, in uh, the lamb of God himself. Okay, so that's the song of innocence, the childlike song, but then there's a slightly darker song of experience, which is called the tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer? What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil? What dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Well, here's a, an interesting question. Did the God who made the little lamb make the tiger who eats the lamb? Songs of experience. Um, and uh, perhaps the best way we should look at this is um, do we want 
God to only be a lamb? Isn't he also the Lion of Judah? Isn't this perhaps what inspired C.S. Lewis to make the Son of God in Narnia a lion? Do we want Aslan to be a tame lion? We are told he's not a tame lion. He's good, but he's not tame. God is both a lion and a lamb. He is both a tiger and a lamb. And C.S. Lewis, I'm absolutely sure, had this poem by William Blake in mind at the climax towards the end of his great novel, That Hideous Strength, when the forces of scientism, the forces of the dark satanic mills, um, the forces uh, who seek to destroy religion in the name of science, the scientistic uh, superciliousness, which turns out in the novel to actually be demonic. It's anti-nature as it's transhumanism, it's anti-human. In Lewis's novel, it is a tiger that is let loose amongst these enemies of civilization that wrought the anger of God as it rips its way through killing these people. No, Aslan is not a tame lion. And God is not a tame tiger. We'll finish with one other poem by William Blake. Or at least we'll finish our look, look at his poem, uh, poetry. And this is, you know, what is love? The, 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 the quintessential important question. You know, the, Beat the Beatles say all you need is love. And they are completely correct. All you need is love. But what is love? What does John Lennon mean by love? Is it the same as what Jesus means by love? Because that's the important question. And these are questions that are being asked in this poem by William Blake. The clod and the pebble. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care. But for, an, but for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sung a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet. But a pebble of the brook warbled out these metres meet. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight. Joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. Only 12 lines, but certainly 12 power-packed lines, potent lines. So the Claude basically says that love is selfless. Love gives itself for others, doesn't care about itself, um, sacrifices itself, and through this self-sacrifice builds a heaven in hell's despair. Whereas the pebble, on the other hand, says, on the contrary, love seeks only to please itself, to bind another to its delight. In other words, to uh, sacrifice others for its own self-gratification. Joy is in another's loss of ease. That, it, that basically in having its self-empowered through its pride, uh, it is gets a delight in using and abusing others and in this way builds a head in heaven's despite. It's interesting, however, because the pebble is beautiful and it and it warbles out meters meet. It sings beautifully, looks beautiful. It sings beautifully. The other one, however, is trodden all over. It's ugly clod of clay trodden with the cattle's feet. The pebble is beautiful but hard. What is Blake saying? 
I'm not completely sure that we know what Blake's saying. I'm not completely sure that Blake knows what Blake's saying. But he certainly uh, puts the two versions of love there very, very clearly. Either love sacrifices itself for the other or it sacrifices the other for the self. Um, both words could be called love. And they are called love because in the modern understanding of the word love is doing your own thing. Well, doing your own thing means treading on others. Um, so here we see perhaps encapsulated in this poem the conundrum, the riddle that is William Blake, um, that he is somewhat schizophrenic. You know, anybody who writes a book on the marriage of heaven and hell uh, and tries to see that one somehow ever being inseparable from the other, uh, that sort of dualism is bound to lead to some sort of confusion. So I see romanticism in terms of the first generation, Wordsworth and Coleridge being what I call the light romantics, not light in, as in bud light, um, thanks be to God, um, but as in that which brings light as opposed to that which brings darkness. Second generation, Byron and Shelley were much darker, much more narcissistic, much more um, uh, agnostic or atheistic even. But Wordsworth and Coleridge, as we see, were profoundly Christian. Blake seems to be neither one nor the other. Uh, he certainly seems to sympathize with Christianity. He certainly seems to identify with Christ, but it's a very much a Blakeified Christ, a Christ that's made in William Blake's own image, which is problematic. So uh, in Blake, we see some beautiful poetry, and I hope you do agree with me that this poetry is uh, beautiful and, and certainly prompts uh, some, some good contemplation and meditation, spiritual searching. Um, but it's not ultimately very uh, not marked by clarity. When we come to uh, our next uh, two poets uh, in the authority, we'll look at William Wordsworth and then we'll look at Samuel Taylor Coleridge. We'll see romanticism, which is much ultimately healthier because it's turning towards the light to be found in Jesus Christ. Um, so and, until we get to these lighter, brighter, healthier, even perhaps holier romantics. Uh, thanks for the, so much for spend, spending some time with me in the, uh, the, uh, the confusion of uh, the light and darkness of William Blake. Until next time, thanks so much as always for joining me. And until next time, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters, to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.